Yeah, okay. Thank you, Simona. So I want to talk about power corrections to collider observables and uh, um, the motivation for this, uh, um, for these studies is, uh, well, should be pretty clear to, to all of you. When we um, do experiments in high energy physics, we basically deal with hadrons, with hadronic final states, both at uh, proton, proton, and e plus and minus colliders. But uh, when we do calculations uh, to predict the outcomes of these uh, experiments, very often we use quark and gluon degrees of freedom, and the mismatch between hadronic final states and uh, sort of uh, perturbative degrees of freedom that we use to make predictions for hard scattering processes is described by these power corrections that uh, are shown here. These corrections typically go like the non-perturbative scale of QCD, lambda QCD, over the um, sort of smallest of the hard scales that you have on the problem that is here denoted by Q raised to some power P. And an interesting sort of uh, situation um, that uh, we are currently in, or the, the peculiarity of the situation that we are currently in, is that we, if we, I mean, if we take an arbitrary process, an arbitrary observable, then uh, uh, we cannot even, you know, predict the exponent uh, p in this formula, let alone ca actually calculate these power corrections. Now, on the other hand, you can definitely make some statements about these uh, power corrections to what extent they're relevant because we roughly know what lambda QCD is, we roughly know what Q is. So typical Q at the LHC is definitely in excess of uh, presumably 20 to 30 GeV, sort of the transverse momentum of uh, sort of, 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 of softest jets that, uh, that you observe in the detector. And so if you take this ratio, you get, uh, you get a ratio of about 10 to the minus two. And so if you square this, so if P is two or three or four or five, and then uh, you definitely get uh, a tiny contribution. And so the only interesting case actually is uh, probably P equal to one. And uh, we refer to this case as linear power corrections. Now these power corrections, as you see, they probably give you a percent or something of this order. And uh, of course, again, for the majority of processes, this is probably way too high precision, so roughly irrelevant. But uh, perhaps something like this is of interest for uh, high precision observables, things like strong coupling constants. You will see an example of where this actually becomes relevant. Measurement of the top quark mass, perhaps measurement of the electric gauge boson masses, and things like that, okay? Now, as I said, we don't really have a theory of these power corrections. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a particular model, which is a model of infrared renormal ones, where basically you uh, sort of look at a particular source of these uh, power corrections that uh, you associate with the singularity, with the Landau pole in the QCD coupling constant. So basically what you can uh, imagine doing when you do your perturbative calculation, instead of using this, instead of sort of using the coupling at the fixed scale, you put uh, the, 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 the running scale inside the coupling and then try to do a good honest let's say loop integration, and then at some point you're going to hit a pole, uh, and this pole will lead to power corrections to a particular observable or process. Now there is a <coughs> technical trick that uh, sort of makes this uh, calculations feasible, and this trick is to sort of, uh, it allows you to properly identify the running of the coupling constant. And this trick is to actually use it, the resummation of uh, fermion bubbles, and then formally consider the limit when the number of fermion bubbles goes to minus infinity minus because you want to uh, keep the, <coughs> the, 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 the sign of the beta function as, as in QCD. So I'm not going to discuss any other uh, details of this, of this model. What is important for me is that within this model, if you go through the technicalities of this construction, then you can basically um, figure out that within this model, um, you can get uh, 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 linear power corrections to a particular process X if you uh, sort of understand the linear terms in the expansion of the next lead node QCD corrections to the cross-section of this process or a particular observable 
in the small gluon mass. So basically, uh, you sort of see this in this formula. You can, if you expand around the Landau pole, you see that uh, this lambda QCD sort of plays a role with the gluon mass. And this propagates into, into sort of this, this statement over here. So you take, you, take, you, you, you take a particular process, you do an to lead not a, a QCD calculation with the massive gluon. The gluon mass is supposed to be the smallest parameter in the problem. Then once you have done the calculation, you expand in the gluon mass and you try to see whether in this expansion you have terms that are linear to gluon mass. If you find these terms, then there is a very simple connection to the power corrections that uh, I, I, I showed here. Okay, there is some translation formula essentially. And if you don't find them, you claim that at least within this model, there are no uh, linear power corrections um, that you can, that you can in, in a particular process. Now, <clears throat> the important point about this linear uh, gluon mass corrections is that uh, they're non-analytic in the gluon mass. When you have a propagator, you, the propagate is one over k squared minus the gluon mass squared. So if you want to get a linear term, you need a square root of lambda squared. And because of that, these corrections are non-analytic. Now, uh, everybody who you know, has done such calculation knows that if you want to have uh, a non-analytic dependence on a particular parameter, then uh, it actually comes from a very particular kinematic configuration or some corner of the parameter space. Now, in this case, um, in the majority of cases, and this covers all the cases that I'm going to discuss, uh, this, this particular region is, is the region where the energy of the emitted gluon is comparable to its mass. And this, since the mass is very small, then we're basically talking about very soft uh, gluon emissions. Now, it is important to stress that this setup, at least uh, traditionally, was applied to processes which do not contain on-shell gluon, well, do not contain gluons at leading order. So in this sense, when you do your next to lead node QCD calculations, the non-abelian vertices are not allowed. Now, I will most of the time stay within sort of a similar paradigm, but uh, later on I'll discuss an example where I do have gluons at uh, in tree level at, at the at, 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 at lead node process, but this gluon is going to be highly virtual. So I'm talking about uh, I will be talking about QQ Q, Q bar annihilation into a TT bar pair. So I think in this case one can also sort of apply the same the same model and uh, uh, sort of see what what comes out of it. Now, so now. The technical problem that I would like to discuss is, 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 is should be should be pretty clear. I want to uh, sort of discuss next to lead node QCD calculations with a massive gluon, and my goal is to calculate linear uh, terms in the expansion of a cross section observable in the gluon mass. Now, as you all know, the gluon mass can be well, the photon mass or a gluon mass in certain cases can be used as a as an infrared and collinear regulator. So at least at, uh, if, you, if, if, if we talk about the, the leading power, the leading contribution to the cross section, then it is logarithmic in the gluon mass and the virtual corrections. It is logarithmic in the gluon mass and the real emission corrections. You put these things together and you basically get uh, the cancellation of these leading logarithmic terms from the point of view of power counting. Of course, the logarithmic terms correspond to lambda to the power zero if we're interested in the linear uh, corrections to the cross sections, linear in the gluon mass, then we're talking about next to linear term in the expansion in lambda. So I said that these terms primarily uh, almost, almost, almost always come from the soft expansion. So basically we're interested in the expansion of the um, cross sections or matrix element of the phase space around the soft lead, so the soft uh, gluon emission limit up to subleading terms, and the, up to the first subleading term. Now, <clears throat> if you want to do an extra lead node calculation, you need certain ingredients, they're well defined. You need a phase space, which includes the massive gluon. You need a matrix element, which also includes you know, this uh, additional gluon being radiated by particles that you have at, at, at the Born uh, process. And you also need observables that also have some dependence on this uh, gluon momentum and presumably on its mass. So if I want to understand how to expand in uh, the gluon mass, 
And then there were these three ingredients that I have to discuss. And then if I want to sort of supplement this with the, uh, with the calculation of virtual corrections, I also need to say something about them. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss this, these three things one after the other. And I start with the matrix element. So I need to, I need the matrix element up to the first um, subleading term in the soft expansion. And there is a, a famous, uh, by now I think, theorem, Bernard Kroll law theorem, which basically tells you that uh, you can get the next two uh, leading term in the soft expansion by essentially just knowing the uh, elastic amplitude that uh, uh, here is denoted by, by this function, plus the derivatives of this elastic amplitude. Um, this J is the econal current that you see here, the standard one, almost the standard one, and this L is a differential operators. Now, I'm looking here at a particular process, which is a single top production. I'm focusing on the lower line where bottom turns into top, and I write formulas and discuss everything for, for this process, but to generalize, I'll say a few things at the end of, uh, I'll say how this, how this, how, how this, this, this construction generalizes um, later in the talk. Now, um, it is important um, uh, that, uh, that this formula, although we say that it exposes the dependence on the, on the, photon, on the photon momentum, because in this function there, are no dip there is no dependence on the, on this, on this, on this soft gluon momentum left. They're all either in the current or in the, in, or, or in this operator L. It is to be, to be, to be remembered that in some sense, the momenta that appear here in this matrix element squared, they do not satisfy the momentum conservation. So one has to be a little bit careful with uh, the meaning of this formula, but uh, um, you know, this thing will be uh, corrected when I uh, start talking about the phase space. So basically the punchline here is that uh, you can write down a closed formula using this, this theorem, which basically completely exposes the dependence on the soft uh, momentum up to next to leading uh, power in the soft expansion. And we're going to use this formula to actually integrate over the uh, the, the radiated uh, gluon momentum. You can play a similar game with the virtual corrections. So here, the important thing is to organize the diagrams for essentially a process that you're interested in, in the number of, uh, in, in, by considering diagrams, uh, sort of organizing diagrams by looking at how, how many times uh, a virtual gluon couples to external lines. So this is a diagram where this happened twice. This is, uh, you know, where it happens once. This is also where it happens once, and this is where it doesn't happen at all. So this diagram, diagrams like this, they cannot give you uh, linear dependencies on the, or, or next to soft contributions. These diagrams can, you give, uh, can give you a soft contribution, and this diagram uh, requires a little bit of work. But if you put everything together, and again use sort of the same, the same idea that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Byrne, Kroll, and Lowe used to derive this formula, which is basically connect the uh, amplitude where gluons are radiated from external particles to uh, the amplitude where gluons uh, are radiated from inside this blob. So if you use the same, the same sort of idea, you can uh, express the virtual contributions through basically the same objects that appear in the real emission contribution. Basically, this is what you see here. This is the lead order. Uh, elastic piece, these are derivatives of the elastic piece. This is a contribution that appears because some, uh, you know, particles, the top quark is massive, but this N is basically the leading order amplitude with some external legs amputated. So basically the message here is the same for the virtual corrections if you need, if you work through next to leading uh, 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 power in the soft expansion, you can do something very similar to the um, um, BLK theorem and uh, write down a formula with, where the dependence on the, on the, on the soft momentum, on the, on the, on the, on the soft, on the gluon momentum is, 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 is completely exposed. Now here, of course, you can just go ahead and integrate over the, this, this momentum. And this is a completely trivial calculation. And uh, well, I'm not going to discuss it. I'm going to use the result uh, for the virtual contribution after this integration has been done. Now, 
as I already said, uh, um, the, the, the meaning of this uh, uh, Burnett call low theorem is a little bit symbolic because on the leading uh, amplitude, um, the momentum conservation is not really uh, present. And um, this makes the whole construction a little bit more complicated because if I want to integrate over the gluon momentum for an arbitrary process, I don't want to specify what this n is, I need to somehow find a way to factorize the phase space um, uh, into sort of a born phase space and the radiative part such that uh, I can actually perform this integration in a process independent manner up to next to leading uh, power. And it turns out that uh, it's relatively straightforward to do this. You can redefine the uh, momentum of hard particles essentially absorbing the gluon momenta into sort of newly defined momenta of a top quark, of a D quark in this case, so final state quarks. And there is a relation between the old momenta and the new momenta. You see that uh, the, 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 the dependence on the gluon momenta appears in this, in this formula, the same happens here. And uh, this, uh, these redefinitions are constructed in such a way that if the original momentum was, uh, top quark momentum uh, was on the mass shell, then also the new momentum was on the mass shell. And the same happens for, for D. So with next to lead not a power accuracy, the phase space factorizes in this way. There is a correction coming from the Jacobian of this transformation. But what is important is that this is just a born phase space with the redefined momenta. I have to write some theta function here, some heavy side function here, to ensure that uh, when I integrate over the gluon momentum, there is an upper cut. I cannot integrate forever because uh, this, may, this will make no sense. But uh, uh, so this uh, function I'm not writing here, it is present definitely, but uh, one can convince oneself that, uh, that if, you, if you actually look at how, how this, 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 this cutoff works, in, in practice, then it, all, it only induces the, the, the quadratic uh, corrections in the gluon mass and not linear corrections. So linear corrections are very special and you can basically forget about the, uh, you know, the fact that you cannot integrate uh, over the, the gluon momentum <coughs> independent of what is happening here. So there is this factorization and this factorization or this, uh, this momentum transformation that you have to do if you want to integrate in a process independent manner, this, uh, this momentum transformation also takes care of this problem that I mentioned that uh, in the leading order term in the uh, bernard crow law theorem, um, there is momentum and non-conservation because now what you're going to do, you're going to re-express momenta uh, in that formula in terms of the new momentum, then again expand in the, in the, in the, in the gluon mass and get uh, uh, you know, a formula where every single entry is well defined. So if I do this, then basically for the real emission contribution, I get something like this. So this is the formula that uh, is a consequence of the uh, bell car theorem. This is the momentum redefinition. This is a phase space transformation. And this is basically a formula that I will get for the real emission correction you see that uh, there is just the, the tree level phase space integration over K in this formula has already been performed. Everything is proportional to the lead node amplitude squared or to its derivative, so you see here. Now a similar calculation for the virtual corrections gives this formula. Again, up to this term, the, the, the situation is very similar. This is the lead node of phase space. This is a tree level matrix element. Either it appears with some coefficient or it is, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's derivative enters. So basically, in principle, if you put the two things together, you should, you should, you should, you should ideally observe a cancellation of this, of this term or come up with a statement that they actually do not cancel. Again, this is all about single top production for, for the time being. Now, you can see probably by a naked eye that if you actually take the sum, you're going to see you know, the, 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 there will be no cancellation, okay? So even things will be there. And the reason for this is that this is sort of not the end of the story because there are two other sources of this linear power corrections that uh, appear. One of them is the renormalization. So you have to actually include the mass renormalization and the wave function renormalization for the external massive quark. And if you do that, you are going to find that uh, this uh, renormalization constants also have linear power corrections. 
And then another thing which is important, and this we know actually from B physics very well, where these kind of discussions were happening 20, 25 years ago, you know that uh, even if you have a perfectly well-defined quantity, but you use sort of the pole mass or other parameters that, are, that have uh, enhanced infrared sensitivity, um, you know, to, to write down the result of the perturbative calculation, then you sort of inadvertently introduce the sensitivity to uh, uh, contributions that are proportional to lambda QCD. So you can sort of expect that something very similar will be happening also in those cases, in, in cases where you sort of look at, uh, uh, at the production of massive quarks at colliders. And so what you would like to do is to sort of redefine a mass, move away from the pole mass and go to something like an MS bar mass or better uh, mass choices, which, uh, which sort of uh, are closer to the pole mass, but, but don't have this, this linear sensitivity to infrared scales. Now, it is also an interesting technical question how to perform this mass redefinition for a very general process. If you have a process where you parameterize the phase space and where you sort of know the matrix element, you can sort of change the mass. But uh, if you don't know that, then it becomes an interesting question how to do this. Again, what it turns out that you can again construct some sort of momentary definition for the top quark and for the, uh, another outgoing quark in this case, D, so that at the end of the day, you can write down a general formula that uh, uh, connects the, the cross sections, uh, evaluated with the, with, the, with the pole mass, whoop, evaluated with the pole mass and with this, uh, with this short distance mass. And again, this is a, a general formula as you see here. So now there are sort of several contributions that I have to put together. Um, I have to say that I only talked about this lower line where the top quark is. I didn't talk about the upper line. Now it turns out that if you look carefully at what happens at, uh, you know, for, 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 for contributions where, 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 where you only have massless quarks, and this is definitely what is happening in the upper line, then uh, in general, you don't have uh, linear power corrections. This one can, this kind of, this statement one can, one can definitely make. So I'm only talking about this lower line where you have a massive quark. And then, as I said, I have basically four sources of this linear power corrections. The real emission contribution it is here, the virtual correction, which is here. And then I have the, the, the mass redefinition contribution, both explicit and implicit, and also the contribution that comes from the renormalization constants. Now, if I, if, if, if I sum these four contributions, put them together, I basically get this result that you see here, and the result is zero. So basically, with this, you prove that there are no linear power corrections to, um, well, in this case, process or any process that, uh, that, that looks like um, a single top production. So the, the difference with the single top production, it's not very important for, for any phenomenology, but I can keep this additional uh, sort of colorless object X in, it doesn't matter what it is, you still have this, this, this cancellation. So there are no uh, linear power corrections to processes that uh, a single top production like, okay? Now, the thing that we did recently was um, um, a generalization of this thing to um, a TT bar production and QQ bar annihilation. And an interesting aspect of this is that, of course, in this case, you do have gluons in the Born uh, process. And you can sort of, if you say that, okay, I'm interested in Tevatron physics, for whatever reason you, you might be interested in Tevatron physics at this point in time, you can even argue that QQ bar annihilation is the, the leading production channel of uh, TT bar. This is definitely not true for the LHC. But even in this case, the situation is uh, such that you do have this uh, highly virtual gluon in the tree level. So if you start emitting gluons, then you have a, 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 a three gluon vertex. And then if you start giving a mass to the same, you, are, you may be wondering, what do you do with the, with the gauge? And what, 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 how, do you, how you reconcile this, this mass of the gluon with gauge invariants? Now, uh, it turns out that in this case, because the gluon is, so, is, is very virtual, you actually can easily construct what you need to put here by just uh, looking at, the, at, by just using this uh, BKL theorem. So you apply it directly. This is a contribution that is sort of 
the contribution that the, the emission that doesn't come from the external legs, it comes from this, this thing that <coughs> appeared as a blob previously. And so if you require the transversality of the matrix element with respect to the gluon momentum, you basically determine this contribution through this. And uh, if you look carefully at what happens, then uh, you, you get uh, sort of a familiar uh, dipole structure, dipole-like uh, structure of the radiation. So this is the, the color-correlated leading or the matrix element, and this object, these W operators, they basically uh, look like this. These are combinations of this econal current and the derivatives. So uh, there is an interesting relation of all this to, to this uh, large enough summation, because basically if you start looking at uh, sort of the various contributions, then you find that uh, already at next to the ignore there is this diagram and clearly this diagram has nothing to do with the uh, problem uh, with the running of the coupling constant all the way down to the Landau pole. So basically what happens, uh, I think, is that uh, there are sort of uh, different types of uh, this uh, uh, vacuum polarization contributions. There are some that are shown here and here and here that basically make sure that in the hard process the, the, the alpha s that appears is renormalized on the hard scale, on the scale q. So this is this and then this and this and this. And then there are others which are not shown here which basically correspond to uh, Fermi line insertions into, into, into the into the in, into the soft uh, soft soft gluon propagator, which basically then describe the the uh, the, the, the the possibility that uh, that if you integrate your low momentum, you're going to hit the Landau pole. So it, it seems that uh, even in this case, you can sort of uh, work within this paradigm. The only thing that you have to be careful with is that. When you write an amplitude, you have to, and you take a derivatives that uh, are required by this LBK theorem, uh, BLK theorem, and then uh, you also have to take a derivative of the running coupling constant because it also has a non-trivial dependence on this on this scale. But apart from this, it seems that um, the the discussion basically just goes through. Now, this only applies to uh, the highly virtual gluon where you have sort of this imaginary scale separation. But uh, not in general. But uh, for the for the for the for the on-shell gluons, we still don't know how to do it. Now, with these qualifications out of the way, you basically just repeat the steps that uh, I discussed in the context of single top production. And uh, what uh, you find is that uh, also in the case of QQ bar to GT bar, there is a constellation of linear power corrections to the total cross section. And what is interesting, perhaps, I don't know, maybe in the context of parton shower or something, is that uh, these constellations actually, you can arrange this constellation to happen within each uh, color dipole, okay? It doesn't need to happen like this, but you can choose your momentary redefinitions, your momentum mapping in such a way that uh, these constellations happen within uh, sort of individual color dipoles. Now, this was a discussion about total cross sections. And uh, we see that uh, it appears that there are no linear power corrections to relatively complicated processes, not uh, as complicated as multi-jet production, but nevertheless to something that is actually pretty uh, real. And uh, of course, it is also known that there are linear power corrections to, uh, that there are power corrections to um, differential observables. This is known from the plus and minus annihilation in two jet production in the plus and minus annihilation discussions that were happening 30 years ago. Now, within this formalism, you can basically see something uh, very similar and do something very similar. So you look at an observable X and you write sort of a contribution and you, 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 you sort of calculate, you can say generalized moment related to this observable X by integrating over the differential cross section now you can imagine that this quantity is, uh, I don't know, some some beam in a some in, in a distribution or something like this. And uh, for the for the for the purposes of illustration, I'm going to look at, uh, at at the dependence of this observable on the mass of the momentum of the top quark. I'm not looking at any jet observables, nothing of this type at this moment. So basically, then the following thing happens: we can go through the calculation again. I need to basically make sure that I know how to expand this uh, differential cross-section d sigma up to next to lead order term on the soft expansion. 
I also need to make sure that, uh, uh, and this, as you, as you heard, is well for definition of uh, momenta. So I'm going to redefine momenta, and the moment I redefine momenta, I get, uh, I get, I get a shift in this Q, I get, a, I get a change in the argument of this observable X. So this, this, this change is small, so I can expand in Taylor series, and then I get two contributions, basically, since I only work to next to leading power. There will be a next to leading power coming from this cross-section D sigma, multiplied with the original sort of uh, uh, function x, and we now, we have just discussed that, uh, that, that these contributions will all cancel, okay? All these contributions will just cancel out. And then there will be a second contribution where you don't do anything to this cross-section, but you expand the observable. And these contributions will not cancel because they're new. So you can do a calculation using this, this, this formalism that I discussed, because basically what you need, you need a proper remapping of the momentum. And then you can sort of calculate the shift. The important point is that once, since, since the, the change in the observable is already uh, proportional to the gluon momentum, then the matrix element that you need and the phase space that you need, they're all leading order phase spaces and matrix elements. So basically you just need a conal currents here and nothing else. Now you can then write this whole thing in a nicer way. Uh, essentially putting back the shift into, into your original formula, and then it will look like this. This coefficient CA, so this formula is, 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 is valid for the TT bar production. This coefficient CA are basically color factors, and these delta PTA things, they are proportional to the gluon mass, and some shifts, some, some, some momenta that I don't show here, but these momenta are basically functions of the momenta of uh, hard particles that appear at leading order. So I can, now look at uh, particular contributions. So for example, the transfer momentum of the top quark look like this. Tau is this quantity, 4MT squared divided by the invariant mass of the TT bar pair. You see the dependence on the non-abelian color factor that uh, is an interesting thing. There is also the change in the rapidity distribution of the top quark in the center of mass frame. Um, now you can take these formulas, put them into uh, a photon code, uh, integrate with the pattern distribution functions, and uh, then you get uh, results that look like this. These are the leading order distribution, the transfer momentum distribution of a top and the rapidity distribution of a top, and the corrections that you see are here. The corrections are small everywhere, but uh, of course in this case, if you go closer to the threshold, as you see from this one minus tau uh, quantity in the denominator, they, you know, start being enhanced. If you are above, uh, if you are, I don't know, 10 GV above the threshold, the correction is about uh, half a percent. So these are not gigantic effects, but, uh, but, uh, but they do exist. And of course, the fact that they are even smaller than they should be is related to the fact that when you move with the invariant mass, at some point you cross zero. And so <coughs> there is a sort of a natural, a natural uh, mechanism uh, of making this, this, this result smaller. So I want to show you another sort of similar thing. I, I'm not going to discuss this in, in any detail, but this is another thing that, uh, that uh, um, I think is interesting in the sense that uh, it does have some phenomenological implications. So one of the things that you can also try to do in this, uh, using this formalism is to calculate this uh, power corrections within this model for this rejet uh, production in plus and minus annihilation, in particular for the shape observable, so the C parameter and thrust. Now, such power corrections, you know, are important for the extraction of the strong coupling constant from shape variables. And uh, of course, as I said, we don't know what to do with the on-shell uh, gluons in born process. If you look at sweet jet production, you have cuckoo bar and glue. And uh, so what we do, and this was a sort of what Paul and Asson suggested uh, in a slightly different context, but uh, he also, he suggested basically to get rid of this gluon, but uh, sort of uh, keep the kinematic features of the process. So what we do, we emit a photon instead of a gluon, then we have a kinematics of a sweet jet process, and then we can basically go with, uh, with the analysis. Now, an interesting thing about this thing is that uh, you have to let the, uh, the soft gluon decay into a QQ bar pair because your observables are defined at the level of QQ bar of, of the final state particles, or so you think. 
And so the C parameter looks like this, and then this, this L is actually a QQ bar pair that originate from the decay of uh, a soft uh, gluon with the mass lambda. Now you go this through the same gymnastics. Again, you use the fact that uh, it's only the observable that uh, gives you the linear power corrections. You cannot get uh, linear power corrections by changing the uh, production cross-section, which is basically what uh, we have been seeing also in the context of uh, top four case. <laughs> And so then, if you go through all this, you find uh, a formula that looks like this. It probably looks a bit convoluted, but uh, there is a well-defined, there are well-defined structures. So this is this piece is just the the, the self energy, uh, the cut self energy, uh, the vacuum bubble contribution, basically the phase space of, of the Q and the Q bar coming from the decay of of this gluon. Then you see that there are only equal currents because. The whole sensitivity comes from the, the linear power comes from the from the observable. And so this is the difference of the two observables, once calculated with the soft quarks and the other without. So basically one needs to integrate this formula over the momentum of the quarks and the momentum of the gluon. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that this integration is actually quite interesting because uh, if you do it right, you're going to understand the famous uh, Milan factor that uh, people in the 90s uh, sort of uh, found when they were trying to compare the calculations where a gluon was decaying to a QQ bar pair and the calculations where the gluon was not decaying to a QQ bar pair. So basically they found that uh, the decay of this guy has a relatively minor role. Uh, it basically leads to, uh, you know, the need to multiply the result which you get by sort of ignoring the fact that uh, this guy might decay. Uh, you can all, you, for, for any observables, for, for most of the shape variables that were studied, you need to multiply the result without decay to QQ bar pair by a particular factor. So this factor looks like this. And uh, so if you sort of go back to this formula, uh, look at it for a while and uh, sort of uh, understand the right way to integrate it, which is not very natural. You will actually uh, find it sort of a, a definition of this Milan factor that uh, looks like this, and then there is an observable dependent contribution. So basically, there is always this relation, something that is related to the observable, and uh, then the proportionality coefficient that is universal for uh, a large number of shape variables, and then the result of the prediction. Uh, the result of the calculation. Now, for a particular case of, of C parameter, if you do this calculation, you will get this very simple formula where this uh, K and E are basically the elliptic functions. Okay? So, these are the conclusions. And uh, I'll probably just leave them there uh, for you to see. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please go ahead and ask. Thank you very much, Kirill. Questions? Not really a question, but just a remark on maybe slide 11 or 12, where you discussed the TT bar production, where you can have a gluon from the intermediate off-shell gluon. Right, so, for instance, yeah. So, when you look at the LBK theorem from the point of view of soft collinear effective theory, you actually realize that all the next to soft terms come from the emission of external legs. And so that actually tells you that uh, you never have to worry about these things. Um, it's what, essentially what, what you have on the next slide where you attach the gluon to, so that's already one loop to a bubble. It doesn't give to next to soft correction intrinsically from there unless you have sort of the hard momentum flowing no, only no, through one line in the... No, no, it does. No, but that part is already <coughs> accounted for. It's there. Yeah. Right. No, no, but uh, I mean, when you radiate the extra gluon from the bubble, for instance, right? Yes. The you, need, you, need, you need all of them. You need this one, you need this right. one, and you need this yeah. one, and they together combine into 
sort of an emission from, I don't know, a derivative of this thing with the scale Q. This is but what happens. That's the, that's the emission from the external leg in the LVK theorem. It's already accounted for. Uh, you know, I would phrase it differently. I would phrase that if this is the, the leading order, I think we're saying the same thing, but you know, I'm, I would say it like this. If this is my leading order amplitude, okay, so that I have this Q here mm. in the coupling constant, then I can use this amplitude and apply this LBK or BLK theorem, and this, this will give me the right result. Exactly, so it's like ignoring the problem. Hmm? It's like ignoring the problem that you have an extra emission from the internal amplitude. Right, because everything is in fact accounted by by, by the derivatives, yeah. Right. yeah, by the gauge invariance. Okay, whatever whatever you want to call it. Okay, it's all will be will be in 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 this in this term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a very naive uh, question. So. When I compute power corrections to the PT distribution of a TT bar pair, I know that there are linear power corrections. PT okay? distribution of a pair? Yes. I don't so, know, maybe. Uh, I understand that what you are doing here is different. So I was trying to, 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 to understand. Uh, so here you are saying that there are no linear power corrections. To the to what to the total cross section yes but I'm saying there are power corrections to for example transverse momentum distribution even of a single top yes but not to the pair hmm? not not to the pair well this I don't know you have a particular attachment to the transverse momentum distribution of a pair I don't so I know <laughs> But, uh, but, okay. but, but I would guess that there are, because, you know, there is, there is correction okay. to this one, there is a correction to rapidity, okay. there is a correction to the invariant mass distribution. So it seems that uh, you really have to do something if you want to ensure that an observable doesn't have it. Now, this distribution, it's a, I mean, this correction is essentially a shift. You see, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a shift. Then, uh, so the other question I have, so, the, so here, if you understand you, I mean, you have a model for these uh, non-perturbative effects, okay? So what are the limitations Martin of this model? Martin has a model. Yes. I'm following the model. So how, what are the limitations of this model? So can I take it as a proof that, there are, strictly speaking, there are no linear power correction, non-perturbative linear power corrections? Well, well, I mean, maybe you can comment that. Well, uh, well, let, let, let me let me say something, okay? So I think, uh, f f as I said, you know, I'm not looking at QQ bar to TT bar because uh, I don't know any better. I mean, I would like to look at glue glue to TT bar. Okay, but this yeah, I yeah. Not, limiting, okay? Li yeah, okay. So this is this is one thing. The second thing, of course, there is a um, there is um, um, I mean, we're looking at, 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 at relatively simple things that next to lead not, right? So suppose I make this statement about next to lead node and then I go one loop higher. Can it happen that if I go one loop higher, things will start working slightly differently? Okay? okay? So I'm not sure. I mean, you see, there is this, I mean, I can motivate this by, by, by looking at the normal models, okay? I can also motivate it differently. I can say I have a good way to gauge infrared sensitivity. This is my gluon mass. Okay, it's Lorentz invariant, you know, up to restrictions, it's in gauge invariant, da, 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 all this fun stuff, okay? I want to check the degree of infrared sensitivity to that, uh, that these processes and these observables have, all right? Now, I would like to make an order statement, but I can't. Okay, thanks. I do have a question about uh, your slide on the C parameter one of the last, when you calculated this. Uh, so not, yeah, the one where you have the lambda with the, the next one, I think. So, uh, no, the pre, yeah, not this one, yeah, sorry, yes, the lambda F times WC, exactly. So uh, my question is, uh, um, 
I mean, this uh, power correction for the C parameter have been uh, calculated with this model and they are reasonably behaved, I would say. Uh, my, my question is that could, could you apply this uh, um, insight to the um, hemisphere mass or the mass difference, which was the one that was behaving uh, quite crazy when you were reaching the limit, and uh, perhaps explain it in terms of this uh, observable <coughs> dependent function? Is this something that you could so, look into? So, so yes, you can do everything. The problem is, so I think Nasson and Julia actually did it. So Powell and Julia, they did it, okay? They ah. looked at all possible, you know, shape variables and calculated this, uh, this, these things, not, uh, not, not, not analytically numerical. And I don't remember for which, so they, they found that uh, for all observables, things kind of work fine for all shape variables, but for one, they were still working in a strange way. And I don't remember which yeah, one. Is this uh, the hemisphere mass or yeah. the mass yeah. difference? I think it's, uh, it, it completely uh, it it goes, goes towards the, the opposite, direction, yeah. uh, the opposite uh, expected value from the two-jet limit. Yeah. And I was wondering whether you have an analytical understanding in terms oh. of this uh, observable dependent function, because when last I heard that this was not explained why the behavior no. was... Uh, yeah. no. Kirill, I have a short question. On one of the slides, when you showed numerical results, you had uh, alpha s times lambda, and you put it to be 0.3 GeV. Yeah. Um, can you somehow comment on this? Uh, how yeah, do you come up is, with that is, number? This is, this is it is just crystal ball, or? This is my greatest achievement, okay? <laughs> so basically, you see, so I, I do, so in some sense, I need to take this same, okay? This same. And I have to say, you know, I have to put some number here if I want uh, this, uh, these distributions, this, uh, you know, to, to produce these two. So now, what I do is this. I look at uh, delta m top divided by m top. Okay? Then the formula is very similar. It's alpha s pi lambda divided by 2 pi mt. Okay? And then, as uh, some people in the room have argued, the uncertainty of the top quark mass is 200 dmv maybe 150, because some other argued that 300 MeV is then set. Well, okay, never mind. <laughs> so I take, I take it from the top quark mass uncertainty and then basically, you know, translate it into this. Okay, thanks, thanks. But it's not an exact number, of course. Uh, you know, yeah. but in, the, in the old days, uh, there was this parameter alpha zero, which is uh, related to this, and it was fitted from event shape observables with a value that's not so much, I mean, it was like 0.4 or 0.5, yeah, yeah. so. I mean, this is not an exact science, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I take it from the, t from the, from the top work mass and second. So, it is, it is, okay, the, the reason you take it from, uh, from the top mass is because you are looking at processes with the top quark. So are, are you no. saying that if it was... No, no, I'm saying that, uh, I'm saying that, uh, I'm saying that if, if, you, if you remember this alpha s pi lambda 2 pi mt, okay, which is, which is basically the the thing I need to turn into, into, I mean, I need to turn this alpha s p lambda p times lambda divided by 2 pi into a number, and if I look at uh, the relation between the pole, if I look at this, okay, then uh, this is basically 200 dBV according to certain people. Yeah, I mean, if, if you take this gluon mass trick, literally, for the Venomalon model with the minus large and f limit, then uh, of course this order lambda term tells you something about a certain singularity in the Borel transform of that series. That generates an ambiguity and in the end alpha s times your little lambda turns into lambda QCD Ooh. times some number. Yeah. And so then, then it actually tells you what you should put up to the fact that this renormalon model, of course, doesn't predict really the constant in yeah. front of this lambda QCD correctly. Yeah. But I take a shortcut because, you know, uh, you and Matthias and Paolo and Andrea, to some extent, uh, discussed uh, in great detail what this uncertainty in the top work must should be. And I take this number and then this thing. I mean, for, for my purposes, this is more than enough, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's the same number. It's a ballpark, it's a ballpark number, right? 
Right, I see no other questions, so, ah, sorry, I missed you. Oh, this is going to be complicated. <laughs> Uh, I have an even more naive uh, um, question. So you said uh, this is like an understanding at, uh, at this loop order, and uh, of course, I mean, it would be cool to have it at a higher loop order, but uh, since you're testing non-perturbative uh, uh, power corrections, isn't the fact that you can't go, I mean, you don't really have like a kind of like an ordering in alpha S as you would have uh, for, for example, perturbative power corrections, right? It kind of like makes sense to say, oh, if I only think about uh, one emission, then okay, maybe I can capture the leading and the next leading uh, log uh, or, or some, some alpha is counting. But in the non perturbative uh, uh, power correction, this counting naively to me seems that kind of like doesn't hold, right? So, of course, it's interesting to start at order alpha s, but uh, um, I mean, what is kind of like your predictive power uh, by neglecting uh, alpha? I mean, there is some other uh, power counting argument why you can neglect uh, uh, desired order corrections, or you say, okay, I can do this, uh, but you know, I have like an infinite tower of uh, uh, similar weight contribution that I'm completely neglecting, and uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just like missing one of the, the key point uh, here. But, no, no, I mean, it's, it's a model, right? So it's a model, <clears throat> it's a well-defined model. You can do certain things, you can see certain things. For example, you can see this. It was not seen before. And uh, I don't know, you can maybe try to understand in some other way. I cannot. You can also, you know, try to see this. It was also not now. And there is a well-defined problem. What to do if you want to put a real glue? Okay, so whether it makes sense to, you know, consider higher orders in this setting, I would say yes, because we learn from this sense. You see, the problem is that if you go to three and four loops, you don't learn anything. But in this context, you do learn something, because it may be that things will change. Okay, so, so far, this construction, strictly speaking, they work for non-abelian, for, for abelian uh, part of the problem. And the question is what non-abelian interactions are doing. Maybe they're doing something, maybe they do nothing. I don't know, you see? But uh, I would like to learn. I don't think that uh, pushing it, uh, you know, yet higher and higher would, would actually make sense. But uh, I think if you want to go one or the higher for processes where you have non-abelian interactions, okay? And then this may tell you something. I don't know, Martin, what do you say? Is it, is it already very clear that, for example, for Drell Yan, there are no linear power corrections? Is this absolutely clear? You want the state to be on no. record? <laughs> no, no, I mean, you can, you can, I'm just curious, because there were some arguments by, you know, Karczemski after, I mean, there was a whole story, right? First Karczemski, then you, and then again Karczemski saying that uh, maybe you go to high or low order, there will be something, I don't know. What's your take on this? I mean, from, from the renomenal model point of view, we'd say it's safe only at the one loop level. Yeah. I, I don't know. From the later understanding, I would say it's probably, I mean, difficult to get something at linear order because you would have to, I mean, at linear order you, you, you get something which in that case is also sensitive to transverse momentum, right? And you cannot write really an operator with a single transverse momentum. And so, I think no, no one really looked at uh, sort of the non no one really looked at the non-perturbative power corrections, let's say, for inclusive Trillian from the SCT point of view, right? Despite all these recent developments, mainly at the perturbative free summation, where one has linear power corrections in the perturbative free summation variable, but probably not uh, non-perturbatively. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean... <coughs> I 
I mean, the main difference between the perturbative power corrections for the dry Young threshold is that they are sensitive to soft physics, right? In the inclusive dry Young case, the one is not sensitive to soft physics at sort of the leading power level, and it's only higher orders like one over Q to the fourth where presumably soft physics enters. And if it's only collinear, you cannot have linear power corrections for an inclusive process. Yeah. So that's why I think it's pretty safe to say that it cannot be linear for the inclusive Trajan cross-section. Dependence uh, does the spin or is the angular momentum that play a role or is not a, a valid question? Um, sp sp spin of what? So this, so spin. So this is uh, these are formulas that uh, that are summed over spins. So this is you know this is a real top quark and a real I don't know down and a real B, so, but if you sum over, over the spins of these guys, then, uh, yeah, the spin sort of dependencies, they all drop out, basically. They don't play an important role. And I think there are generalizations of the same also for sort of polarized, uh, polarized uh, matrix elements as well. You expect that the each uh, uh, individual uh, uh, elicity or polarized amplitude has the same contribution uh, or linear mass dependence or the, the, the one that you get is uh, the result of the individual uh, polarized I, contribution. I'm not sure what I, what I, what I should say. I, I, I think I would do, I, I do expect something like this. Now this is single top reduction. So the top quark is actually, I mean, these guys are, you know, there is a left-handed current in this block. And it doesn't doesn't do any 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 harm. But in general, if you ask, <laughs> can I construct a polarization observable where something funny will start happening? I don't know the answer to this. Right. See no other questions. So let's thank you again. <laughs>